Um, I've, I've probably read this verse before, quoted this verse before. I may have preached from this verse before, I don't know, but I got to thinking about it. It's been on my mind all morning. Psalm 126 and 3, the Bible says, The Lord has done great things for us. Whereof I am glad. You ever notice that verse? He says, The Lord's done great things for us. Whereof I'm glad. Ain't that great? <laughs> yeah. That's what I'll preach on this morning. Ain't that great? Yeah. You look at what God's done. I got thinking about this morning and the last couple of days, every time you turn on the news, seems like one bad thing after another. Things that make your jaw drop and you go, how in the world can people do things like that? How can people do other people like that? How in the world can sin gets so bad to where those kinds of things happen in life. Right. And, and as I wondered and pondered on all those things, I come in the house of God this morning and this verse has been on my mind all morning. <laughs> Say in a dark and troubled world, in a sinful world, ain't God good. <laughs> you take God out of the picture, man, you still got all that sin. You still got all that worldly chaos. You got all those bad things. And nowhere to run. <laughs> I'm glad he's my safe haven. I'm glad he's my place of shelter, my my present help in day of trouble, my day of my time of trouble. God is my place of safety. Yes. Amen. God is my help in time of need. Ain't that great how good God is? I was looking at this verse and thinking about it this morning. And if the psalmist was to stop it, the Lord has done great things, he'd be telling the truth. If he just stopped right there and didn't bring us into the equation, you think about all God's done, and God's done some great things, ain't it? Ain't time would fail us to talk of all the things. There ain't enough time in a day for us to talk about all the great things that God has done. Even this world cannot ignore some of the great things that God has done. When you look at creation and they look all around them and they see all these great things, they got to know in the back of their mind that that didn't come from some explosion. That didn't come from a big, big bang. That didn't come from evolution. That came from a higher power, an unseen hand, a God of greatness that could do all the things that they're looking at. The Bible says in the beginning, God. Yes, sir. <laughs> I like that, don't you? And can't nobody else say that and put their name there. In the beginning, who? Ain't nobody but God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's been many inventors in this world, but there's only one creator. Many people say, I created this. I, you ain't created anything. You, you invented something out of something God created. You can't make something out of nothing. Only God can do that. He created the heavens and earth. You look around you at all the great things. I promise you, there'll no, never be a duplication of it. You'll never see where there's an earth number or two. That's right. You'll never see where there's the newest or latest model of the earth. Right. You know why? Because there's one creator and nobody can duplicate him. Nobody can copy him. Nobody can do the great things that God has yeah. done. When's the last time you walked outside at night on your back porch or your front porch and you looked up at the sky at night and you looked and you seen the moon and all those great stars all across as far. Do you realize there's people at some point in time at night that do the same thing in Africa and in Haiti and all over the world they walk out at some point in time and they look up and they say, look at that. Who done that? Nobody come. Einstein don't come to mind. I'm telling you that right now. That one that that one that created the light bulb ain't never created the, the greater and the lesser light and the sun and the mo and then the stars and all the galaxies. They ain't none of them come to mind. You know who comes to mind? God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When's the last time you walked out there like Abraham? And he said, Abraham, I want you to look up and look at the stars. Your seed's going to be as the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. And that reminds that gets me on my next thing. There. He said, I want you to see if you can count the sand. Man, I can't count a handful of sand. He's talking about all the sand in the world, Brother Jim. And he said, Can you count the stars? Can you count the sand? How you think it got there? <laughs> you ever walked out on the ocean and stood on the shore 
and looked and seen all that water. I thought, how in the world did that get there? How in the world? The Bible said the firmament showeth His handiwork. Yes, there was an unseen hand put that water there. Amen. You walked out there and looked, and looked as far as you could see. And the eye is not strong enough to see as far as that ocean goes. There's not a telescope, any kind of scope, any kind of eyeglass you can find in this world to go from one side of the ocean to the other and see from one side to the other. But you know what God done? He meted out heaven with a span. He, he measured the dust of the earth. He, he, he measured in a little measure, the Bible said, in the palm of his hand. God's done all that. If you ever walked outside and looked at the stars, walked out on the ocean and looked across the ocean and said, look at that. Ain't that great? What in the world? How did that happen? I'll tell you how that happened because there's a God in heaven and he's a great God and the Bible said he's done great things the psalmist said. God's done great things. When's the last time you walked up to the top of a mountain? You rode up to the top of a mountain. Nobody walked up there. When's the last time you rode up to the top of a mountain and you got on the peak of it and you looked out at all God's creation and said boy ain't that beautiful. Has anybody else ever done that? Looked at it and said, man, ain't that beautiful? How, how in the world can that be there? Who, who done that? I can tell you this, there is no architect class that can teach you how to hang the sun and the moon. There is no architect class in any college that can tell you how to fill this earth with water. There ain't architect class to tell you how to build a mountain and create a mountain. You can't do it. There's no architect smart enough. There's one great architect and his name is Jesus Christ. And he built all this. He created all this. And the psalmist said he's done great things. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say he's done great things. <laughs> for us right. for not only has God done great things but God done great things for our benefit he done things on our account he gave us salvation which is the forgiveness of sin he's given us mercy and grace which we don't deserve he's given us eternal life in heaven I'd say God's done some great things for us wouldn't you right. if you stopped it God done great things that's great but God done some great things for you yeah. Ain't that great? I mean, these are great, great things that God's done for us. The Bible said, unto us a child is born. Yeah. Yeah. Who did it say it was for? <laughs> let, me, let me see if I can get that right again. He said, for unto us a child is born. Yeah. If it stopped there, that's good because that's God's son, but that ain't where it stops. Right. It says, unto us a child is born, unto us. A son is given on Calvary's cross. Yeah. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. God's done these great things for us. He said, if I go away, I will prepare a place for yeah. the angels. Yeah. No, he said, if I go away, I will prepare a place for Wayne yeah. and for you. Ain't that great? The creator of all the world, all the earth, God has prepared a place in heaven for us. How do we know that? Because God moved upon, the Spirit of God moved upon holy men and they wrote it down as the Holy Ghost came upon them and they wrote it down and because of that, guess what God done? God preserved a book for us to know it all. God preserved a book. Do you know, Brother Charles, I read in the Old Testament where they was writing on the scrolls, they was writing down and recording the Word of God. Brother Tony, you probably remember reading this over in the Old Testament and a man took a pen knife and cut it in half and threw it in the fire. You tell me how we got it. I'll tell you how God preserved it. How did God, I'm telling you, he's walked through the fire, he's been in the fire, and he can get that out of the fire. Amen. Some people say, what if I'm cremated and thrown in the ocean? How can my body be raised? I'll tell you what, if he scooped up dust and it didn't have any life in it, and he breathed the breath of life into it, and he made you out of dust, I promise you he can gather you from one end of the world to the other and resurrect your body. Amen. He created the water they're going to throw it in. He knows where it's at. Amen. He filled the oceans full. He hung the moon and the stars. You can't ever say God ain't never done nothing for you. God hung the moon and the stars for you. God done the, God gave us water across this great land. I think that's pretty good, don't you? Amen. The only way for us to have the whole word of God is for God to preserve it. You think about it, down through the years, all the scrolls, yes. all the words that was recorded of what God said. He said the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost moved upon holy men and they wrote it down as they were moved by the Spirit. 
Now how in the world are you going to get all this together? The Bible teaches us, this is in the book of Psalms, that God preserved it. God kept it. So that you can have that. There's no other explanation for it, really. How in the world we got the complete Word of God? But I'll tell you how we got the complete Word of God. By the same hand that hung that moon. <laughs> the same one that filled that water with earth. The same one. But I want you to think about these three things that I mentioned to start with about God being great and some great things He's done and God creating all these things for our benefit. I want you to think about it, the sun and the moon. The Bible calls them the greater light and the lesser light. They're for us day and night. You realize that? It's for us for day and night. Do you realize if there was no life here on this earth, there'd be no need for the sun and the moon? If nothing was alive here, there'd be no need for the sun and the moon. If the, if, listen, these oceans that I'm talking about, do you know who put them here? God put them here. The water that God put here. Do you know why they're here? Why is the oceans here? Because I don't know if you know this or not, there's a lot of things you can live without, but you can't live without water. Amen. So God put the sun and the moon here for us. And God put the oceans here and all the water here. Why? For us. I talked to someone said God's done some great things, but he didn't stop there. Those great things God done, he done for us. Now some of y'all sitting there saying, Preacher, you got my attention on the sun and the moon. I can see that. And you got my attention on the water. I can see where we need that. But a vacation to the mountains every year, that don't count as something spiritual God done for me. No, you're right, but that ain't what God done for you. But if God did not create the mountains, there would not be a hill called Calvary. Amen. Where God put His Son on a hill called Calvary and hung between heaven and earth and died on an old rugged cross so that you could go to heaven when this life's over. You'd be forgiven of your sin. It's because of the blood that He shed on that mountain that day that you get to go to heaven when this life's over. Amen. Don't tell me God ain't never done anything for you. If we stop at the sun and the moon, He done it for you. If you stop at the oceans, God done it for you. If you stop up at the mountains that God created. He done it for you because he knew one day there would be one specific mountain and he, his son would hang on that cross and die for you and for me. Ain't that great that God thought enough of you and loved you enough to create that mountain knowing that that's where he would hang his own son? I'm going to tell you what, if that had been my job and that had been my, if that had been me, I'd have scrapped the blueprint right then and there. I'd have been all right with creating, creating the world. I'd have been all right with creating all these other things and giving water where you need it and giving the sun and the moon and the stars where you need light. I'd have been all right with all that. But when it came time to make a mountain where I was going to put my own son and let him die a cruel death on the cross so sinners could go to heaven when this life's over, I'd have scrapped the blueprint. I'd have said, forget it. It's over. This is where it stops at right here. But God has done great things for, my, for us, for me and for you. He went as far as the Calvary and died on the cross for you. Ain't you glad God didn't change his mind about sacrifices when it came to the time for his son to be the ultimate sacrifice? Do you know God? How you know tell how many millions of sacrifices God has received the blood on for an atonement for sin, an atonement for sin. God received an atonement for sin over and over from the blood of bulls and goats and calves and two turtle doves. But when it came time to build a mountain and create a mountain where his son would be the one sacrifice for the whole entire world, God didn't change his mind and say, let's go back to the other sacrifices. I'm glad I don't have to come with a goat. I'm glad I don't have to bring an animal. I'm glad I don't have to bring a sacrifice. I don't have to bring anything. I have to bring myself unto God and come just as I am and believe that God paid the ultimate sacrifice on Calvary's hill. I'm telling you, God's done great things for us. That's where I would have changed my plans. When it had been said, all right, now's the time to put Levi up there so all the rest of this crowd in the world, so Osama bin Laden can have a chance to go to heaven. I'd say you need to tear that one up. Right. You need to scratch that book. Let's start over with another one. But we got the complete Word of God. And in there we find out the story where God so loved the world that He gave His only. Not just a son, not an angel, not a spirit. God gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty great. I think that's, ain't that great? That's great that God has done these things for us. Well, the psalmist don't start, stop there. He says, God has done, the Lord has done great things for us. And then he says this, whereof I'm glad. Amen. Ain't you glad God done that? 
Now I'll stir your heart a little bit. Hey, man, after the news I've watched this week and all the things I've heard throughout the last month and the last year and all the bad things happening in this world, it's good to come hear some good news. It's good to read my Bible and find out what great things God does for me and how much He loves me. And the Bible says, whereof I am glad. I know that a lot of you come to church and you think that the preacher gets up and a lot of times he's trying to fill his space in a sermon. He's trying to fill up time. And he gets up there and says, I'm glad God saves old sinners. I'm glad God still provides. I'm glad God does this. And I'm glad God does that. I'm glad God saves and I'm glad God forgives. And I'm glad God washes my sins away. I'm glad this. And you think that the preacher's just taking up time. I'm telling you right now, if the psalmist was here, he'd have said the same thing. He'd have said this today, the one that wrote that book. He'd have said, God has done great things for me. And I am glad about it. If I ain't glad about that, there ain't nothing to be glad about. Amen. He said, God's done great things for us and I'm glad about it. Why we walk around so many times with our arms folded and a sour look on our face? Why we come into church a lot of times saying, I sure be glad when this is over. I ain't so sure why I came today. I probably should have stayed home. My toe hurt. I should have stayed home. We ought to be glad. We ought to be glad to be able to come in the house of God. We ought to be glad that God's done all this thing. Do you realize He hung the sun in the moon for you? He created all this for you. He's given His Son on a hill called Calvary for you. God loves you. Ain't you glad that God loves you? I ain't up here to take up your time. I ain't up here to fill a little space in your day. I'm here to tell you the truth that the psalmist said God's done great things for me and for you. And we ought to be glad about it. Amen. God saved my soul. He paid the sin that I could not pay with the blood of His own Son. And I'm telling you, I'm glad about what God's done. He's done great things. Greater is He that's in you than He that's in this world. I'm like the psalmist. It makes me glad. I'm glad about it. And the psalmist wrote it down and I, I'm not going to write it down, but I want to read it and I want to say it. And I want to let other people know how glad I am of what God's done in my life. And if I believe this, the psalmist was here, I believe he'd say the same thing because that's what he wrote. Job said this in the Old Testament. He said, I know my Redeemer lives. I know. My, how does he know? Number one, he wrote it down. <laughs> Number two, he knows by experience. Amen. Number three, he knows because he talked to him. <laughs> I know a Redeemer lives. Uh-uh. It was a personal thing to Job. He said, I know my Redeemer lives. He ain't just Job's Redeemer. He ain't just my Redeemer. He's your Redeemer. I know my Redeemer lives. He's my Redeemer. It's a personal thing. God's done great things, but He didn't only do it for this world. He done it for us. He done it for you and for me. And this world cannot look around and see all that God's done, all the great things God's done, and ignore it. They might deny it, but they can't ignore it. They can't look out there and say, there's no ocean. (laughs) They can't look up at night and say, there's no stars up there. They can't look around and say, there ain't no mountain right there. They can deny it, but they can't ignore it. Even this world knows God has done great things. But I go a little deeper than that. I know God's done great things for me. All that He done, I just said, it's for me. If I wasn't here and you wasn't here, God wouldn't need the sun and moon. God wouldn't need that water. And God wouldn't need that mountain. But God did put it here for a reason. And it was all because of you and all because of me. I'm going to say this and I'm done. Say, preacher, I already know all this. I read it in that book. I already know all this. It's been preached to me before. Do you know there's a script over in Samuel that says this? Samuel was talking to God's people. They was talking about Samuel intervening for them and talking to God for them. And Samuel said this, You ought to consider what great things God's done for you. It's in there. You can go find it. Get your concordance. Go look it up. I can't tell you where. I know what side of the page it's on. It's over in Samuel on the left side, top side of my page. It says this, You need to consider. You say, Preacher, I know that. You need to consider what great things God's done for you. Think about it. You know, he says consider. That means you need to think about it. You need to consider. We consider how much it's going to cost us before we take out a loan. We take in consideration how long we're going to be with a person before we marry them. We 
take in consideration a lot of things. The Bible said we need to consider. We need to think about what great things God has done. When you walk outside tonight and you look at the moon and the stars, you need to consider why they're there. When you look out in the ocean, next time you go down to the beach, I'm sorry, to the ocean. When you go to, uh, uh, say people call it the ocean. When you go down to the ocean and you look across that water and you go down there, you need to consider how it got there. You need to consider why it's there. You need to consider how you got water out of your well. You need to consider how you got water out of your faucet. It's because God done great things for you. And the next time you decide to go on a trip through the mountains, I want you to consider out of all the mountains in the world, God made one different than all the rest. It's called Mount Calvary. Where God's Son laid down His life for a sinner like me so I can go to heaven when this life's over. Next time you go on vacation, you go to the mountains. Don't just get your itinerary out and just plan all this stuff and say, let's go here and let's go do that. Let's, when you lay your head down that night and go to, before you go to sleep, I want you to consider where you're at. You're in a place that God created. And God done all that for you. Don't ever tell me that God's never done anything for you. If He stopped at the three things I've talked about today, that's enough. If He didn't provide a thing for you to go in your house to eat, if He didn't provide a house for you to live in, if He didn't provide a way for you to go, if He didn't provide anything else, He's already done enough. When he made that mountain and he hung his son there and the son of God became the son of man so the sons of men could become sons of God. Let's all stand. God's done.